spent the last, so, two, two and a half months in the New Testament book, The Acts of the Apostles. We have studied from the conversion of Saul into Paul into his shipwreck in the missionary journeys. Over two months studying about Paul. Which is a wonderful backdrop as to what's going to happen over the next nine weeks. Over the next nine weeks, we will spend five of those weeks beginning today in Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. And then four weeks in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. This melds together because as we go forward, we can understand Paul's situation while in prison. We can understand his theology and his priority as he addresses these churches. So we begin in the fourth chapter of his second letter to the church in Corinth. And I begin by asking a question. Who among us doesn't want a treasure? If you knew you were going to get a treasure by coming to church, who wouldn't come? We are promised a treasure from God. Now, when we think of treasures, we often think of riches, materials made of gold, silver, platinum, marble, brass, ivory, glass, or coin. Treasure is often understood as a reversal of fortune, whether it be found in an inheritance, a lottery ticket, or discovered riches. But we are told that our treasure, the treasure as believers, are stored in jars of clay. Now we know something about clay, it's quite inexpensive, somewhat fragile. If I throw this up in, up in the air, it would probably break. It is vulnerable. But our treasure, the very light of God's glory, resides in this frail, broken humanity of our bodies. It resides in these fragile jars of clay. And I want to take just a moment before we share communion to fathom this treasure that Paul talks about so that we can understand it in a way that will aid our practical lives. And it begins with this. That the ultimate treasure in life, which is the very light of God, does not lie somewhere out there. It lies within us. Verse 6 says this, For God, who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, made His light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. I am learning more and more that seeking meaning and purpose outside ourselves is often a life obsessed with a quest of more and better. Now, English teachers will cringe, so hang in there with me for a moment. When our lives become, become consumed with more and we receive it, what is it that we often Hope happens next. More. More, more. And if our lives are consumed about things that are better, they wear out over time and we just then yearn for things that are better. So our lives become more, more of better and better. Okay, English teachers, take a breath. That's not the true treasure in life. Paul uncovers the truth of joy, peace, and happiness is indeed an inside job, and it is never dependent on our circumstances. Now, it is true that things outside of us will satisfy certain cravings, but that is different from living a life of contentment and satisfaction. I love the saying that goes this way. 
It's not what you own, it's what owns you. She won that one this week. It's not what you own, it's what owns you. So let me ask, what owns us? What owns me? What owns you? And the truth I discovered this week in wrestling with this passage is that wealth and treasures are never absolute. They are always relative. Treasures are never absolute because when we get them, we want more of them. We want them better. But God's power and love is completely the opposite because God's love is always absolute and never relative. God's love is not relative on your education, on your looks. God's love is always absolute. That treasure within us. So with that treasure within us, we then learn in Paul's letter that we then can handle whatever comes out there to us. Verse 8 and 9. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, and not destroyed. Now I am an ardent believer that much of life is the result of choices we make. Like it or not, the choices we make day by day, year by year. Well, what about those things we don't choose? Those things that come from the outside, sometimes from out of nowhere, when we encounter disease, tragedy, financial collapse, injury, or a devastating loss. David Jeremiah, in his book entitled A Bend in the Road, says this. I'd like to quote him. Quote, Sooner or later, we will all come to a bend in the road that we didn't expect, couldn't have foreseen, didn't want, didn't ask for, and can't postpone. Where one day everything changes and life moves in a different and many times unwanted direction, comma, then what? End quote. Then what? Now, I don't think Paul ever read this book by David Jeremiah, but he sure could have written it. When his outside crashed in around him, it was the treasure from within that allowed him to rise above his distress, his despair, and persecution. The ultimate treasure of life, my dear friends, is within us within our jars of clay. And when forces outside us threaten to destroy our peace, Paul writes in another letter that we then can be more than conquerors, guided by the light of God within us. Within us lies the treasure. Within that treasure, nothing outside of us can destroy us. But finally, we nurture this treasure within us not so much by looking inwardly, but by looking upwardly. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power of God is not from us. I don't know about you, but I am learning more and more that inner peace is not simply getting in touch with my feelings but rather getting in touch with the creator of feeling. I'm learning that meditation may help, but encountering the very essence of thought moves me deeper. I'm learning that searching for simply good vibes pales in the light of a vibrant, divine communion with God. This treasure moves us beyond ourselves in knowing that amidst our emptiness, our brokenness, our loneliness, that there is one who loved us before we were even conceived. I think it's been about three years now, correct me if I'm wrong, that about two dozen of us went through what was called the Hand to Plow program. And we took about nine months, read a few books, got together, discussed them, had some clergy from around the conference come and lead us through that. And I think we read four or five, six books and met for nine months. And I'll give you my takeaway from that. It's two words. So that. Some of 
you that resonates with? I still hear it in meetings. What I mean by that is that each and every time that we as disciples, we as a church do something, we have to say we're doing it so that, fill in the blank. And if the blank doesn't make sense, flush it. We have children's ministry so that, fill in the blank. We have youth ministry so that, fill in the blank. We gather to worship so that, fill in the blank. And if you can't fill in that blank with something that is worthy of God, it should not be done. That just means you're busy. Now, I am pretty sure that Paul did not take the hand of Paul, of course. But he described the very treasure residing in our jars of clay when he says this. We have this treasure within us to show that. So that this all-suppressing power is from God and not ourselves. 